about the Torah portion because I believe that it is prevalent to not only the future of Israel, but also us today. Um, if anyone wants to borrow or use one of our Kabbalah Shabbat books, you may. I'm putting a copy, I'm putting all the copies here. I'm going to keep one. Because those of you who participate with Kabbalah Shabbat, you know that the very first song we read, reads like this. This is from Psalms 95. And in English it says, Come, let us sing to Adonai, shout to the rock for our salvation. Let us come before him with thanksgiving, with songs shout to him. For a great God is Adonai, and a great king above all gods, who in his hands are the depths of the earth, and the peaks of mountains are his. You see, Kabbalat Shabbat, the Friday night service, we, we have two services. We have Kabbalat Shabbat, which warms us up for what we call Ma'ariv. And the Ma'ariv is the evening service. And every day has Ma'ariv service, but Kabbalat Shabbat and Arab Shabbat are unique to Friday night. They are the warm up. And we celebrate with a series of psalms and songs unique to Shabbat. And thankfully, and I think this is amazing, almost all of it comes straight from Scripture. Do you thumb on page 12 and 13? If anyone wants it, we can get a copy too. That's, that's, and what I just raised on page uh, 12, it's called the Lechu Narandana. And all these psalms center around themes of God's kingship. And how one day, in the Messianic era, all nations will worship the Lord in Jerusalem. And so, we have to understand, Kabbalah Shabbat was formed by Jews in the Diaspora. They're in exile, and they think they're looking forward to the day when we will not be in exile, but all nations will be unified under the kingship of the Almighty. And therefore, we have a series of psalms that set God up as king, king over the whole earth, not just Israel, king over the whole earth. And then we sing Lecha Dodi. It's more or less the equivalent of Here Comes the Bride. And it's all about the Shabbat. And then we have psalms, um, oh, I'm getting my order mixed up. Um, I think it's 92 and 93, which is basically about, uh, well, it's Mizmor Ladav, it's, it's a song for the Shabbat. Mizmor Shir and Yom HaShabbat. A psalm, a song of the day of Shabbat. And it just announces the goodness of God and his justice and what it's going to be like on the earth. And it's like the two have finally come together. The eighth of Shabbat, the queen, more or less, has met the king in his chamber, and now he reigns supremely in an era that's entirely Shabbat. It's a beautiful ceremony, and then we use that to transition into the Ma'ariv. Um, I say all of this because... It's such a hopeful service, all about God's kingship and his reign over the earth and how much good things we have coming to us in the age of the Almighty. But let's look at how page 13 ends. It ends with a song, or with some lines that in Hebrew sound like this. Arba'im shana achu bedohor, ba'omar am tlebefein, v'hem liyadu durekaha, asher nishpatihi. Which mean, for 40 years, I loathe that generation, a people whose hearts go astray. They do not know my ways, so, I, so that I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter into my rest. That's what's happening in this Torah portion. You see, in this Torah portion, the two spies are sent out, and they fail at their mission. And what makes this sin so much worse than the others? Why is it that God has never sent them into exile in the desert before? Why is this one worse? Because these are not spies. Who are they? They're the leaders. They're the elders of Israel. They speak on behalf of Israel. That's why their sin is so much more serious than before when it was just the rabble. Before it was just the rabble, it was just somebody, you know, just complaining. This is the leadership. Moshe handpicked the best. You can see that in verse 3. Moshe dispatched from the Paran Desert, as Adonai had ordered. All of them were leading men among the people of Israel. How many of us know 
that if Robert or I say something or we go astray, it is worse than if just someone else does it. You see, there's a tiered system here. James 3.1 says that teachers will be judged more strictly, not just by man, but by God on the final day. All right? It is so grievous that it was the chief priests who killed Yeshua because they represented all of Israel. That's why it says something that Yeshua saw repentance and revival everywhere he went. But he said the real sin is that Jerusalem didn't repent. He said, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you stoned the prophets and killed those sent to you. How I long to gather you as a mother gathers her hands, but you would not listen. You see, the problem was that the leading spiritual community in, in Israel did not repent. Because that was the city of the king. If Jerusalem had repented, the Messianic era could have begun. And he was saying, your hour of visitation is here if you had recognized it. But they failed. They failed to recognize the hour of their visitation. And because of that, it was lost to them. This generation we're looking at today, they failed to recognize the importance of entering the land. It was here, it was promised, and then it was taken away because they failed at the most pivotal hour. People can walk with Yeshua their entire lives and then fail at the very end. Be careful that that's not us because it's that final hour. And the reversal is also true. I know people who've walked apostate to him their entire lives or in open rebellion only to come into the fold at the end. And I believe that it's that final hour that matters. I want to point something out neat to us, and then we'll move on into the rest of the teaching. I'm in chapter 15, verse 37. We actually talked about this passage today in our class, where we talk about what does it mean to love the Lord your God with all of your heart, soul, mind, strength. This is where the Mufftir begins. God and I spoke to Moshe, speak to the people of Israel, instructing, say to them, throughout all their generations, tzitzit on the corners of the garments, and to put the tzitzit on each corner a teklet. I'm interpreting there. Tech, it, it does not mean blue thread. It is a very unique dye that was common in the ancient world. It was not just any shade of blue. It was a special, it, it came from kind of like the equivalent of a snail. It's to be a seat seat for you to look at and thereby remember all of Adonai's mitzvot and obey them so that you won't go around wherever your own heart and eye has led you to prostitute yourselves. But it will help you remember all my mitzvot and to be holy to your God. I'm Adonai your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt to, in order to be your God, I'm Adonai your God. Um, what I want to point out is the phrase, so that you won't go around wherever your own heart and eyes lead you. Um, the words there are literally spying out. It's the same word as the elders uh, used to describe the elders' job when they were sent to basically spy out the land of Israel. So what he's saying here is, at the end of this parasha, what he's saying here is you guys just sinned because your eyes just went out prostituting yourselves because you're spying out the land. These seat seats, you're supposed to look at them, remember all the mitzvot, and then your eyes won't go spying out whatever your hearts want lead you astray into. Other interpretations include that the eyes refer to sexual immorality because the scripture says Samson saw, uh, saw the woman, uh, Delilah, not Delilah, um, the other one, and he said she is good in my eyes. And then prostituting yourself refers to idolatry. So understand, when we say this, and this is, that final paragraph there is a passage in the Shema. So the third passage in the Shema. And understand, we say that to remind ourselves to stay focused on Hashem and not to go spying out like the, like the elders did in the land of Israel and just looking at whatever and letting the giants scare you. Make sense? So they failed at their hour. And the Lord put the institution of the tzitzit into place to make sure it didn't happen again. We have a call in the present to make sure that we stay faithful and that we do not ever walk astray. 
And by the way, I'm going to go ahead on over to the book of Hebrews, chapter 3. Or if you're reading the David Stern edition, he also calls it the book of Messianic Jews. A bit of a misnomer because I think the book of James was also written to Messianic Jews um, explicitly, as was the book of Matthew and John, particularly. But understand, Yeshua tells parables about servants who are put on guard waiting for their master. And sometimes the servants are faithful and sometimes the servants aren't faithful, but the master comes at an hour they do not expect. Or about wise and foolish virgins. Most of the parables boil down to the same idea, that at the end of time there's going to be two groups of people. And sometimes who those classifications are differs. Sometimes it seems like it's more based on relationship, and sometimes those who are waiting for the master to return. We have a call to always be ready. Recognize that Hashem has not given us even an hour into the future. He has only given us the present, and we are accountable for this very present moment. Let's look at the book of Messianic Jews. Sure. Chapter 3, verse 7. Therefore, as the Rav HaKodesh says, today, if you hear God's voice, don't harden your hearts as you did at Meribah. Which means, which he translates here, bitter quarrel. On the day in the wilderness, when you were, uh, when you put God to the test, yes, your fathers put me to the test. They challenged me and they saw my works for forty years. Therefore, I was disgusted with that generation and said, their heart always goes astray, and they have not understood how I do things. In my anger, I swore they would not enter my rest. Watch out, brothers, so that there will not be. In any one of you, an evil heart lacking trust, which could lead you to apostatize from the living God. Instead, keep exhorting each other uh, every day, as long as it is called today, so that none of you will become hardened by the deceit of sin. For we have become sharers in the Mashiach, provided, however, that we hold firmly to the conviction we began with, right through until the goal is reached. Now, where it says, today, if you hear God's voice, don't harden your hearts as you did at bitter quarrels. Who were the people who, after they heard, quarreled so uh, so bitterly? All those whom Moshe had brought out of Egypt. And with whom was God disgusted for 40 years? Those who sinned. Yes, they fell dead in the wilderness. And to whom was it that he swore they would not enter his rest? Those who were disobedient. So we see that they were not able to enter rest because of their lack of trust. Uh, Dr. Lambert writes a book where he was teaching on the Shabbat at a Protestant church. And um, the pastor was kind of turned off by it. He says, well, just remember that Yeshua is our rest. It's true. If we enter into Yeshua, we have found rest from our work. But the author of Hebrews warns us that there's a coming day and age, one that Joshua could not give the people of Israel. It is the Messianic era, and more immediately, it is our, unific our, our entering into his presence when we die. We have to remember the absolute essential importance of remembering to walk with him today in the present. Not something we can put off. It's not something, well, I can do that tomorrow. I can walk with Lord tomorrow. I can surrender this to him tomorrow. This will be my thing for today. We walk with him and we're accountable to him only in the present. Amen? Amen. So my question to us, I'm going to leave us on this note is what does our walk with him look like? When we come here at the end of the week, my goal is that our walk with him is a little bit different than it was last week. Because we've been walking with him for seven more days, or in my case, 14 more days, right? Because it's been two weeks. And the idea is, if I'm walking with him daily, there should at least be something that I'm bringing to the table that wasn't there last week. And as the scripture says, encourage each other daily. Mm -hmm. This is a perfect place to begin encouraging each other with what the Lord gave you throughout the week. And that's why I think we're going to keep on doing it. After we say the Katsi Kadish, I'm just going to start asking for praise reports, to borrow the term from mm -hmm. Protestantism. Because why not? It works. Uh, maybe I'll find the Hebrew equivalent. Every week. I don't want to hear about the book we've read. Oh, we should be in study. We should be in research. The life of a believer is a life of study. But first and foremost, it's a walk 
with Yeshua. And now from that flows our study and our learning. So first and foremost, my question is always, how is your soul? How is our soul? If I say, how are you doing? I might hear a lot of cool things that you see Jesus doing throughout the world. How is your soul? How are you doing with him? I don't care what he's doing in Africa. I mean, that's cool, don't get me wrong. But how is he working with you? That's the real question. And after that, I want to start hearing about what you're learning in your studies in your own time. But what's he doing? Is he, is he giving you encouragement? Our scripture says encourage each other daily, as long as it's called today. Encourage each other. It builds me up. And hopefully, what I've gained from him builds you up too. How many of us ever just need encouragement? Listen, as the guy up front, I'm going to be honest, I might need it more than anyone sometimes. Because God picks the worst to be pastors. And I can attest to it personally. And so, my encouragement to us is, walk within the present. Do not miss the importance of the hour. I believe it's prophetic. I don't think modern-day Judaism understands the importance of beginning Kabbalat Shabbat with Psalm 95. Here they are singing about the exile and how God will reign over the earth one day. They're talking about the present. They missed the hour of visitation when Yeshua came the first time. We did. But the good news is he'll come back. That, that will happen again. Just because they missed it the first time, the next generation entered the land. We know that Yeshua will give, it, will give another chance, and this time Israel will stick the landing. And then all the nations will go up to Jerusalem and worship the Lord together. 